diffraction in the spatial domain is our topic today. Now, previously, we worked out a technique for calculating the diffraction of a field as it propagates through space. And that was based on the transfer function of free space. H of u and v is e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d, e to the minus i, pi lambda d, u squared plus v squared, where u and v are the spatial frequencies of a plane wave. And the way that is applied is to write an input field, g1 of x and y, in the form of an inverse Fourier transform, an angular spectrum, g1 of u and v, and times the x and y dependence of a plane wave, e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy to u dv. So this represents the field as a superposition of plane waves. And this is at a particular fixed value of z. Then each one of these plane waves propagates according to this transfer function. It suffers this phase change as it moves a distance d along the optical axis. And therefore, the output field, g2 of x and y, is an inverse Fourier transform of this same angular spectrum, but modified by this transfer function. So let's see, we'll bring out this constant factor in front, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d, an integral e to the minus i pi lambda d, u squared plus v squared, our original angular spectrum, g1 of u and v, and then our linear phase factor, e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy du dv. So that is the process of diffraction described in the spatial frequency domain, right, where the u and the v are spatial frequencies. Now, what we're interested in doing today is to get a more direct description of G2 in terms of G1, all in the spatial domain. So we will write G2 of X and Y is a convolution of some impulse response, H of X minus Xi and Y minus eta times the input field g1 of psi and eta integrated over all psi and eta values. So representing now a direct transformation from the input plane to the output plane in the form of a convolution. So to do this, we need to know what little h of x and y is. Well, what is it? Well, it is the inverse Fourier transform of big H of u and v. So little h of x and y is the integral of big H of u and v times e to the i 2 pi ux plus vy du dv. Now, Fortunately, here's h, v, u, and v, and other than this, this constant phase factor here, it has a dependence on u and v that nicely breaks up into one-dimensional quadratic phase terms. And so therefore, this can be written as e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d, an integral in u of the form e to the minus i pi, lambda d u squared, and then the corresponding u factor from this linear phase term, e to the i 2 pi ux du, 
and then times a similar integral in the v spatial frequency, e to the minus i pi lambda d v squared e to the i 2 pi v y dv. So those are the integrals we need to uh, evaluate. Now, fortunately for us, they're really the same integral, one just in terms of u and x and the other in terms of v and y. So if we do one, we'll immediately have the other integral evaluated also. So let's attack this integral. The integral, and by the way, recall that by default, if we write an integral symbol with no explicit limits, that is understood to go from minus infinity to infinity. So the integral, e to the minus i pi lambda du squared e to the i 2 pi ux du. So let's combine those two exponential, uh, complex exponential factors as e to the i 2 pi times the quantity ux, that's from this factor, and then well here we'll have minus lambda d over 2, and that over 2 cancels that 2 to give you just a pi there, uh, times u squared. So that's the integral we want to evaluate. So it's a little bit complicated because we've got u and x mixed up here. Um, we're going to try a change of variable. Let's write u is equal to some constant a times a new variable t plus another constant b times x. And see if we can plug that in here and break up. In this case, it'll be t and x. Hopefully, we'll separate out a little nicer. So if we do that, then this quantity in parentheses, ux minus lambda d over 2 u squared becomes, uh, let's see, x times u would just be atx plus bx times x, or bx squared. And then we'd have minus lambda d over 2 times u squared. Well, let's see, this squared We'll have a t squared, which would be a squared t squared. We will have b x squared, so that would be b squared x squared. And then we would have the cross terms in squaring this, 2 times a t times b x, or plus 2 a b times t x. Now, looking at that, we would like the cross terms, that is, the terms that have a product t times x, so that term there, and this term here, to cancel. So can we get that to cancel? Well, yes, if we appropriately choose our, our constants. So let's write this out here. A t x minus lambda d over 2 times 2 a b t x. We want that to be equal to 0. And let's see, there are common factors of a, t, and x. Here's a, an a, a t, and x. And here's a 2 and a 2 that cancel. And what does that leave? That leaves 1 minus lambda d b is equal to 0, and of course that is true if b is 1 over lambda d. So if we set b is equal to 1 over lambda d, those cross terms there cancel. And then we're left with, let's see, what are, what are the remaining terms? So b times x squared, so that's 1 over lambda d times x squared. That's that term. And then let's get this other x term. So then minus lambda d over 2 times b squared x squared. So b squared is 1 over lambda d 
squared and then all times the x squared there. And then finally, we've got this t squared term. So that will be minus lambda d over 2 times a squared t squared. And let's see. This is 1 over lambda d x squared. Then this is well, lambda d over lambda d squared is just 1 over lambda d. And then this is 1 over 2 lambda d, or 1 half 1 over lambda d. 1 over lambda d minus 1 half 1 over lambda d is 1 half over lambda d. So this is 1 over 2 lambda d x squared, and then minus um, lambda d over 2 a squared t squared. Now, I would like for this last term to have the form of just minus 1 half t squared. In other words, I would like to have lambda d a squared be equal to 1. And we'll see why, because it gives us a, a standard known integral uh, in t squared. And so that will be true if a squared is 1 over lambda d, and so a is 1 over the square root of lambda d. So with that, then going back to our original change of variable u then is at plus bx. Well, that's 1 over the square root of lambda d times t plus 1 over lambda d times x. And then du would be, right, so, so x is a, is a parameter here. We're not integrating over x. It's fixed by fixing the output point. We're integrating over t, therefore, is going to be the, the new variable. And du would be then 1 over the square root of lambda d times dt. Our goal is to evaluate the integral e to the i 2 pi ux minus lambda d over 2 u squared du. And with a change of variable, we were able to separate out um, cross terms so that we broke it up, uh, this integrand up as a quadratic factor in x so that'll give us e to the i, what would be 2 pi um, x squared over 2 lambda d, which becomes e to the i pi over lambda d x squared. And then our du ended up being 1 over the square root of lambda d times dt. So we get a 1 over the square root of lambda d here. And then we've got an integral of e to the minus i pi t squared dt. And that's what we wanted uh, to end up with a uh, 1 half t squared for that previous uh, expression we had on the previous board. So we would end up with this integral being uh, e to the i 2 pi times a minus 1 times a half t squared gives us e to the minus i pi t squared. And the reason is that's a uh, well-known integral, and we can show what the result is here. Remember, this is now integration from minus infinity to infinity. We can start off with something we've demonstrated before, that e to the minus pi t squared dt integrated over all t is equal to 1. And if we let t be equal to the square root of a s, where a is just now some other constant, well, then this transforms to the integral of e to the minus pi t squared will now be a s squared. And dt will be the square root of a ds. And that's still got to be equal to 1 because it's the same integral just with a change of variable. Um, but then from that, we see that the integral of e to the minus pi a s squared ds, move this square root of a over to the other side into the denominator is equal to 1 over the square root of a.
And that's true. For any A that has a positive real part, A is a epsilon, and we're going to write this as epsilon plus I because we what we want to get is this with A is equal to I. So it's certainly true for A is equal to epsilon plus I because then the real part of this is e to the minus pi epsilon S squared, and that's a Gaussian bell curve, and that's certainly integrable. Uh, and then we'll... So that can be, this will be true for this A, where epsilon is arbitrarily small, but not zero. But we'll take the limit, then as epsilon goes to zero, it's never zero, but it's arbitrarily close to zero. And then that'll allow us to write that the integral of e to the minus, now we'll let, right, A is going to be in that limit, it's just I. So it would be e to the minus I pi S squared ds is equal to 1 over the square root of a, and a in that limit is just i. So 1 over the square root of i. So with that, we now have this result here. That integral is just, well, that's just the same as this. We're just t instead of s. So it's 1 over the square root of i. And we've got two of those, right? We had the, the u and x integral and the v and y integral. Those will be the same, just with, instead of x, we'll have y. So we'll get two factors of 1 over the square root of i, 1 over the square root of lambda d. So we're going to get down that our impulse response is going to be, we had that original global factor out in front, e to the i 2 pi over lambda d. And then we have the two integrals, product of the two integrals. And that product of those denominators is going to give us the square root squared. So that leaves i lambda d. And then we're going to have e to the i pi over lambda d. Here we have an x squared. And from the v integral, we'll get a y squared. So it'll look like this, x squared plus y squared. And that, we say, is the impulse response of free space. Well, what does it mean? Well, we'll get to that, but let's first write down our formula for our convolution of the input field with the impulse response to get our spatial domain to fraction formula. So having solved for the impulse response, we can now write the output field G2 of X and Y is equal to, so we had these constant terms, E to the I 2 pi over lambda D over I lambda D, and then our convolution, the integral g1 psi eta e, and this is from our h of x and y now, e to the i pi over lambda d, and then we've got to write this now as the function x minus psi plus y minus eta, both squared, and then integrated d psi d eta. And that is called the Fresnel diffraction formula. So it is represents diffraction directly in the spatial domain. Now what does it mean? How do we interpret this? Well let's think about what would the impulse response of free space B. Imagine over here, say in the plane z is equal to zero, and this would be, we just draw one of the coordinates here, but this would really be a two-dimensional coordinate plane. Uh, we have an impulse. Well, what would an impulse be? Well, right, two-dimensional impulse would be delta of x and y. That would represent an infinitely bright point of zero dimensions. 
And then out here, say as our output plane, we use x and y for those coordinates, and that's a distance d away. So this is out at z is equal to d. Well, what will we get if we have a bright point? Well, it should radiate out a spherical wave. And that spherical wave should travel out and illuminate that plane. And that illumination should be the impulse response, h of x and y. So if we hadn't taken this approach of doing an inverse Fourier transform of the transfer function of free space, but it just started out with physical principles, we might expect that the impulse response would have the form of some constant amplitude to be determined. And then spherical waves, the amplitude drops off as one over the distance. So this would be r, the distance from this input point out to the, uh, I should have made that a little, little clearer. That's directly from that point out there. Um, so it drops off as 1 over r, so that the power drops off as 1 over r squared. And then it has a phase, e to the i, 2 pi, over the wavelength lambda times the distance r. Just saying that if you propagate a distance of one wavelength away from the point source, then the phase changes by 2 pi. So that doesn't quite look like this, but... Let's uh, write what r is. r would be the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which is d, so d squared. Okay, so that's your r. And let's factor out a d squared from under the radical. That leaves a d outside. And then we'd have the square root of 1 plus x squared plus y squared over d squared. Now, in geometrical optics and so far in wave optics, we've been employing the paraxial approximation. And basically that just says that Propagation is very close, remains very close to the optical axis. In other words, distances along the optical axis are much greater than distances um, which are perpendicular to the optical axis or transverse to it. And so that would mean that d squared would be much, much greater than x squared plus y squared. And so this, this horizontal distance would be much greater than any vertical distance. And therefore, this quantity, x squared plus y squared over d squared, would be much less than 1. And we can apply the approximation that the square root of 1 plus u, when u is very small, is well approximated by 1 plus 1 half u. So with that, r will be equal to d times that approximation of this square root, which would be 1 plus x squared plus y squared over 2d squared. And then multiplying through by the d, this would be d plus x squared plus y squared over 2d. All right. So with that, let's see, in e to the i 2 pi over lambda r, we would get e to the i 2 pi over lambda d. Well, that's that right there. And then we would get, well, let's see, e to the i 2 pi over lambda and then over 2d. So the 2s would cancel. You'd get e to the i pi over lambda d x squared plus y squared. And that's precisely this term here in the convolution. So what we see is that apparently... Our impulse response of free space is simply a spherical wave expressed in the paraxial approximation form. So that makes complete physical sense. In this picture, we're thinking of the input as composed of a number of point sources, and each point source emits a spherical wave. 
And then the output field is just the integral or summation of all those spherical waves. So our spherical wave, A over R, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda r, where in the paraxial approximation, we write that r is equal to d plus x squared plus y squared over 2d. Um, for the 1 over r amplitude, we could approximate that reasonably by 1 over d, just by this leading term, because x squared plus y squared over 2d squared is much, much less than 1. And this is just d times that. So this d factor is going to be much, much bigger than that. And therefore, it makes very little change in the amplitude if we replace r by just d. But for the phase, when we do this, we're going to get an over lambda. So we're going to end up with an x squared plus y squared over 2 lambda d, and that is probably not going to be much, much less than 1, meaning it can lead to a significant change in the phase, a significant number of radians of phase. So we won't use that, drop that second term for the phase, and therefore h of x and y would be a over, we'll replace r by d, and then have e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d, and then e to the i, 2 pi over lambda, and then the factor of 2 there gets rid of the 2 in the 2 pi, so it leaves e to the i pi over lambda d, x squared plus y squared. And if a is equal to 1 over i lambda, then we see that this apraxial approximation for the spherical wave is precisely our impulse response. Okay, so this is just a spherical wave with the praxial approximation. And then this gives us a physical interpretation of the Fresnel diffraction formula. So here is the psi eta plane, and here is the xy plane, the z-axis. In the input plane, when we write that uh, g2 of x and y is equal to e to the i 2 pi over lambda d, over i lambda d, the integral of g1 psi and eta e to the i pi over lambda d x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared e psi d eta. The interpretation is that In the input plane, if we have a point at some parameter, uh, some uh, coordinates psi and eta, and that uh, has some amplitude, g1, of some particular psi and eta, that's going to serve as the source of a spherical wave that's going to propagate out and illuminate the output plane. And then if we have another Another point uh, on the input, say up here, is another point G1 of some other coordinates, psi and eta. That also will be the source of a spherical wave that will propagate out and illuminate the entire output plane. And then the output field is just the superposition of all those spherical waves with the corresponding amplitude G1 of the particular psi and eta coordinates. So this is called Huygens.
principle, the idea that any field in any given plane, or indeed on any surface, the points of that can be considered as point sources, each of which produce a spherical wave. And as you move through free space, the diffracted field then is simply the superposition of all those spherical waves. Let's test our diffraction formula. Suppose our field is g of x, y, and z is the plane wave e to the i 2 pi over lambda z. And in the plane, z is equal to 0. Then this would give a field g1 of x and y would just be equal to 1. So let's calculate g2 of x and y as, let's use the formula that we derived in terms of the uh, spherical waves where we had an unknown amplitude a, which we said had to be 1 over i lambda in order to match the Fresnel diffraction formula. Let's just keep that as a right now. Uh, that over d, global phase of e to the i 2 pi over lambda d, and then the convolution, and this is going to be now just of 1, g1 of uh, x and y is just, of psi and eta rather, is, is just 1, and then we have e to the i pi over lambda d, x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared d psi d eta. Now, of course, the output field at some other value of z, z is equal to d, should be, this should be just e to the i 2 pi over lambda d, which would just be this factor right here. So everything else must just be 1. Well, let's take a look at the, uh, the psi integral there. That's going to be the integral of e to the i pi over lambda d x minus psi squared d psi. Uh, and let's rewrite that by swapping the order of the x and the psi to be psi minus x squared, because it's a square, it doesn't matter if we multiply it by minus 1 and swap that order. And let's let t be the variable equal to psi minus x over the square root of lambda d. Then uh, dt is 1 over the square root of lambda d times d psi. x is just a constant. It's the point in the output plane. Then, well, let's see. This integral becomes the integral of, well, 1 over lambda d psi minus x squared is just t squared. And so this becomes e to the i pi t squared. And d psi becomes, oops, um, square root of lambda d times dt. Right, so from here, so that would give us a square root of lambda d out in front, and then a dt. And we've already done this integral right here, e to the i pi t squared dt integrated over all t. It's just equal to the square root of i. So this would just be square root of i lambda d. And therefore, we would also, for the, uh, the eta integral, get exactly the same result. So we get the square of this. So that would then give us the following result, that our g2 of x and y would be equal to, we'd have two factors of that square root. So that would just give us i lambda d. We'd have a over d 
e to the i 2 pi over lambda d. And we know that should be equal to just e to the i 2 pi over lambda d. And therefore, we conclude, right, these, these d's cancel. We conclude that a must be 1 over i lambda. So that shows us how we could have derived the impulse response for the Fresnel diffraction formula by starting with the assumption that it was a spherical wave, expressing that in this form through the paraxial approximation, and then with this calculation we could figure out the unknown amplitude A, that it's 1 over I lambda. So now we have two different pictures for describing diffraction. In the first, we think of the input field, G1 of X and Y, uh, that that is a superposition of plane waves. Oops, plane waves. as described by the inverse Fourier transform. And then we propagate um, each of those plane waves to the output. And then resum. And that gives us G2 of X and Y. That's the spatial frequency domain approach. Right, so thinking of each plane wave as a spatial frequency component, and that's affected by the transfer function of free space. And we're just summing those spatial frequency components at the input and the output. And at the output, each of the components has been phase shifted by the transfer function of free space. Or we've got the approach that we just developed in this lecture, which is that G1 of X and Y is again a superposition but not of plane waves, instead of point sources, delta functions, points. And then each of those produces a spherical wave. And at the output, we sum those. And we get our output field. Okay, so that's the spatial domain approach. So one way we can think about the Fresnel diffraction formula is if this is our input plane, and we'll just draw one of the coordinates, there'd be two, of course, psi and eta, um, and this is the output plane, and we'll just draw the x coordinate here. If we have a particular input point here at coordinate psi and a partic particular output point over here at x, then this is the distance r between those, and we can represent that phase shift, at least the part that depends on x and y, uh, x and psi rather, as e to the i pi over lambda d x minus psi squared. So we can think of this as the phase due to a spherical wave that starts here at this point at the input and propagates to that point at the output. But just by changing the order of the x and the psi, which doesn't make any difference in the value of the function because it's uh, squared, we can take these two, same two points and we can think of this distance going from the output point back to the input, that's the same distance r, 
and then we swap these around, e to the i pi over lambda d psi minus x squared. And that we could think of as the phase that would be produced if we transmitted a spherical wave from this output point and then it reached this input point. Right? And of course, the distance is the same in both cases, so the phase shift would be the same. Um, and these mathematically, these two phase factors would be the same. Now, in the second case, right, that we applied that idea to all the points in the input plane for a given point in the output plane, then we could imagine this phase relationship would be the phase that would be due to a spherical wave transmitted from the output point back towards the input plane. So from this point of view, we can think of, well, if we're just sitting out here, say we're out here at this particular output point, just observing, looking at the field coming at us, we can view that as if we projected this phase, which would be due to a, a fictitious spherical wave that we propagated and used to illuminate the input plane, times the input field, and then integrate it over the input plane. So, in two dimensions, the phase factor e to the i pi over lambda d psi minus x squared plus eta minus y squared. Uh, we can interpret the sum of these squares as the square of a radial distance, r squared is equal to psi, oops, psi minus x squared plus eta minus y squared. And then we plot, here is psi minus x and here is eta minus y. The contour of constant r would be a contour of constant phase. So of course, zero phase would be where psi minus x and eta minus y were both zero, right here at the origin. And then there would be some circle at which that phase would have, let's say, um, we choose rn squared over lambda d to be the integer n. So then in this expression, this over lambda d would be an integer n, and the phase would be n times pi. Right? And then this, we would get a phase of e to the i n pi. And we could have n is equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on. And so what would that radius be, rn? Uh, from this, it would just be the square root of n times the square root of lambda d. So this could be, for example, the r1, that where we'd get uh, 1 times pi for the phase. And then we'd go out a little farther and we'd get r2, where now the phase would be 2 pi. And we wouldn't go as far for the second step here between the two circles because it goes up as the square root of n. So this would be the square root of 2 times this distance. First one would be, of course, square root of 1 would be 1. The second one would only be about 1.4. And likewise, the farther out you go, well, if we look at rn plus 1 minus rn, that would be the distance between two adjacent circles. Right? So the next one out would be even closer to the previous. That distance could be written as square root of n plus 1 minus the square root of n times the square root of lambda d. And we could factor out a square root of n here, and, and we get square root of n lambda d times the square root. We pulled n out from under the uh, square root. That'd leave 1 plus 1 over n in the first case, minus the square root of 1 in the second case. And as n gets big, 1 over n gets small, so we can use the approximation here that that square root is 1 plus 1 half 
of 1 over n. And then the second term, of course, is just minus 1. And the, the, the two ones cancel, and then you have 1 over 2n, and the square root of n over n would be 1 over the square root of n, so this would end up then being, right, this is approximate, and so that would end up being the square root of lambda d over 2n. And so this difference in radius would vary as 1 over the square root of n. So as n gets really big, the difference of radius would get very small. So you can imagine these, these circles then, and these would be projected, that's what this factor here would mean, this would be projected back on the input plane, it would multiply the input field, and then you would integrate over the entire uh, psi eta plane. Now, what's going to happen is that you get as you get very far away from psi is equal to x and eta is equal to y right here in the center, um, these start to these uh, circles get very close together, and that means that the phase is changing very rapid. So we get more rapid oscillations the farther out we get. Now, what's that going to mean? Well, when we integrate a very rapid oscillation, if it's time is a field that is not very rapidly oscillating itself, those integr integrals are going to tend to zero. So the only place we're going to get a significant integral then is in here in this in this region where the uh, the phase is essentially uh, stationary here where you have this inner circle. So let's look at that in one dimension. We can see it a little more uh, graphically. So let's just look at the psi and x dependence. e to the i pi over lambda d psi minus x squared. Say so we have that, that term. And we'll take just the real part of it so we can plot it. And that'll give us the cosine of pi times psi minus x squared over lambda d. And that is this blue curve right there. So what we can see is that it's very slowly varying right around its argument is equal to zero. And then as we get farther away, the variations become much more rapid. So imagine this black curve is our input field. We're just again looking just at one dimension here. Our output field is going to be the product of the input field times this blue curve. And then we're going to integrate that over all psi. Well, what's going to happen? Well, if this input field is slowly varying with respect to the oscillations of this blue curve, uh, out in regions like out here, you're going to, the integral is going to tend to wash out any value of the input field because you're integrating something that's slowly varying and then times a very rapidly varying phase. Whereas in this central region over here, what you're going to do basically then is just over that region, you're going to just get the average of the field over a, a width of about equal to the width of that. Let's think of it as like the main lobe of that structure. And so in there, you're going to get kind of an average And if the function is much more slowly varying than this main lobe here, that average is essentially just going to be the value of the function at the corresponding x is equal to psi. So let's see, what would be the width of this lobe here? Well, let's, uh, of course, at, at uh, psi minus x is equal to 0, you got just cosine of 0 is equal to 1. Let's see where the phase it goes to pi over 4. So that would be where psi minus x squared over lambda d would be 1 fourth. So then you get pi over 4. And so if you take the square root of that and solve for psi, you would get psi is equal to x. 
plus or minus the square root of lambda d over 2. And that would give you basically the, the extents of this. And so the total width then would be about two times this difference, or square root of lambda d. So we get now this physical interpretation of the square root of lambda d as being basically the, the width of this main lobe of this oscillatory uh, function. And of course, there would also be an imaginary part, which would be the sine of this. And when we multiply that by a slowly varying function, we're essentially just going to average the region within this square root of lambda d interval. And everywhere else, because of these rapid oscillations, you're going to basically wash out the result. So if you just take the product of this black curve and that blue curve and integrate it, you get this the value of this red point. If you then allow x to vary, so this is a set up so that this plot is for x is equal to 0. And then if you allow x to vary, you just shift the entire blue curve left or right. And as you do that, and you multiply by the black curve and integrate, you trace out the red curve here, which is essentially this g2 of x here is essentially the same as g1 of psi at psi is equal to x. In other words, you basically just recreate the original field. It's almost like uh, uh, doing a convolution with a delta function. And we call this condition the near field condition. So if g1 of x and y, let's say it this way, does not very much over some length a and if the width of this main lobe here square root of lambda d is much much less than a then we could solve square both sides and solve for d d would then be much much less than a squared over lambda and our result would be that g2 of x and y would be essentially just g1 of x and y would get the same output field and of course we would have that additional phase factor e to the i 2 pi over lambda d for propagation at distance d so this would be the near field result the field would be basically the same, the output field would be basically the same as the input field, there'd just be this global phase shift e to the i 2 pi over lambda d. Now, let's go back to the uh, geometrical optics picture of things. And let's suppose we had an aperture like this. And we had set of parallel rays incident on this structure. And this would produce, well, if we let the aperture function be g1 of x and y, which would be 1 in the clear region and 0 in the opaque region, then this would correspond this set of parallel rays to an incident field, which would just be e to the i 2 pi over lambda z. And if this was z is equal to 0, then this would be a function which would be 1 in the clear region and 0 otherwise. And the geometrical optics prediction would be that these parallel rays that made it through the clear part of the aperture would just go on forever and ever. And then, therefore, at some, say, z is equal to d, the output field would be g2 of x and y 
which would just be this same field and just be propagated over this distance and that would just add a global phase factor of e to the i 2 pi over lambda d n times the same input field. So that's the G, GO, the geometrical optics picture. And from our analysis of the near field condition, that could be written as the square root of lambda d is much, much less than a, which is the distance over which um, the input field does not vary significantly. And in this case, we could take that to be this aperture. And we can see that that condition could be uh, met if either the wavelength goes to zero, and that would be the geometrical optics limit, or the distance d goes to zero, and that is the near field limit. So that near field result that we've just derived makes sense in terms of geometrical optics. It's the same limit effectively, except for this, this phase factor right there. Of course, obviously this would be different whether lambda went to zero or d went to zero. But other than that global phase factor, the fact that the field stays the same is the same whether we look at the geometrical optics limit or this near field limit. So they're in that sense, two versions of the same thing. Now we're going to look at another limit called the far field limit. And uh, let's rewrite our Fresnel diffraction formula. e to the i 2 pi over lambda d over i lambda d and then times the integral over the input plane of the input field times a quadratic phase factor e to the i pi over lambda d x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared d psi d eta. Now let's just look at the x and eta, uh, x and psi term uh, rather, and then We'll do the same thing to the, the y and eta term. So looking, pulling out this quadratic phase in x and psi, e to the i, i over lambda d, x minus psi squared, we can expand that out by doing the square. Here we'll get x squared plus psi squared minus 2x psi, so that'll give us e to the i, pi over lambda d, x squared, e to the i pi over lambda d psi squared and then e well minus 2x psi will give us a minus i 2 pi over lambda d x psi okay so that's the expansion of this this part of the quadratic phase and of course we get a, a similar one for the y and eta terms and so what we end up with then is that G2 of X and Y can be written as our overall global phase and amplitude factor, E to the I 2 pi over lambda D over I lambda D. Then we'll have this quadratic X phase, and then we'll also have a quadratic Y phase from the, the other factor there. So we'll get E to the I pi over lambda d x squared plus y squared and then we'll have the integral g1 psi and eta and then we'll get this psi squared and then we'll get a corresponding eta squared quadratic phase so e to the i pi over lambda d psi squared plus eta squared and then we get the linear phase terms that, those will be e to the minus i, and we can write them as 2 pi x over lambda d times psi. And then from this term, we'll get uh, 
y over lambda d times eta. And we, then we have our integral d psi d eta. So that is just a way to reformulate the Fresnel diffraction formula. And notice what this integral has the form of. It's some function of psi and eta times e to the minus i 2 pi, and this guy we could think of as a spatial frequency, x over lambda d would have units of inverse meters, meters over meters squared. We could interpret that as a spatial frequency u, and then this term we could interpret as a spatial frequency v. So this looks like a Fourier transform of this two-dimensional function. So we can rewrite this as e to the i 2 pi over lambda d over i lambda d, a quadratic phase factor, e to the i pi over lambda d x squared plus y squared, and then times this integral becomes a two-dimensional Fourier transform of g1 psi and eta, the input field, times a quadratic phase factor, e to the i pi, over lambda d psi squared plus eta squared. And this would be evaluated at u is equal to x over lambda d, that's this term right there, and v is equal to y over lambda d. So there's another interpretation, and in fact another potential way to evaluate the Fresnel diffraction formula. Take the input field, multiply it by this quadratic phase factor in psi and eta, take the Fourier transform of that, evaluate it at u is x over lambda d, v is y over lambda d, multiply by this quadratic phase factor in x and y, and then by this global phase and amplitude factor. Now, it would be very interesting, wouldn't it, if this phase factor right there was effectively equal to 1. Because then, this would just be the Fourier transform of the input field. This would just be the angular spectrum of the input field. It would say that the output field would just be a version of the angular spectrum of the input field. It would be a Fourier transform, 2D Fourier transform of the input field. So for that to be true, of course, then that would require that psi squared plus eta squared over lambda d would be much, much less than 1, so this would be e to the i pi times a very tiny number, a very small phase shift. And that would only be true, of course, if psi and eta were limited, meaning the region over which g1 of psi and eta is non-zero was limited spatially. If it was, then we could get to a large enough distance d so that this phase would be essentially e to the i zero, and the phase factor would just be one. So we would like to have e to the i pi over lambda d psi squared plus eta squared about equal to one. That would be true if psi squared plus eta squared was much, much less than lambda d. Well, if here is our input plane, and if the input field is non-zero, only inside a circle, they have radius a, then this, of course, would be less than or equal to a squared. And so our condition would be a squared was less than or equal to, or, well, I'm sorry, actually much, much less than lambda d. a squared would then be much, much less than lambda d. And we could then turn that around and get what we call the far field condition. The d would be much, much bigger than a squared over lambda. And in that far field region, 
the output g2 of x and y would be the global phase factor e to the i 2 pi over lambda d over i lambda d and the quadratic phase factor e to the i pi over lambda d x squared plus y squared and then times the angular spectrum of the input big g one evaluated at angular freq uh, at uh, at spatial frequencies oops x over lambda d and y over lambda d and that represents far field diffraction which is also called Fraunhofer diffraction. Now, one question we might ask is, how could we go about actually producing a particular optical field? So let's look at a simple version of that. What about an optical field that is just one in certain regions and zero elsewhere. So imagine we have a screen which is opaque in certain regions and clear in other regions. And we illuminate that with a plane wave e to the i 2 pi over lambda z. And then at the plane z is equal to zero, we place this screen. We're going to call the transmittance of this screen, T of X and Y, uh, to be equal to 1 in the clear region and 0 otherwise. Oops. Then we would expect that immediately after the screen, the field would be G1 of X and Y, which would just be equal to this incident field, which at Z is equal to zero, is just one times the transmittance. And so we could generate a field at an input plane that was one in the clear region of the transmittance function and zero otherwise. And more generally, this transmittance function might have a continuous variation of transmittance. We'll talk more about transmittance functions later, but this is one way you might create such a field. Now, there's an assumption here that if you illuminate a screen like this, the field is one in the clear part of the aperture. In fact, this is only an approximation And that approximation is called the Kirchhoff boundary conditions. In the few cases where we can make exact electromagnetic calculations of this kind of a situation, we find that it this is a very good approximation, but it's not exact. There are so-called edge effects. At the edges of the screen that produce slight variations to this. So this is a good, good approximation, but it's not exact, but we will use it because it's good enough for our purposes, generally speaking. We will look when we uh, examine so-called half-plane diffraction, uh, which is a problem that can be solved exactly. We will look at the errors imposed by this approximation, the Kirchhoff boundary conditions.